Hello and welcome to Planet Outlook. My guest today is a Rolex laureate, Dr. Kriti Karan. She is an award-winning wildlife scientist and the director at the Center for Wildlife Studies in Bengaluru. Thank you, Kriti, for joining us on this show. Uh, before I go to your work, now we as a country, India as a country, we have been very proud of our relationship with nature, very proud of our coexistence with our wildlife. We kind of tell it across the world. But this coexistence is slowly changing to animosity and conflict, the area that you are focusing on for the last several years. So for the viewers, if you can give us a backdrop of what is the ground situation, how things are changing. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. I'm very excited to be here. I think fundamentally, India is more culturally tolerant of wildlife than perhaps m more than any other country in the world. I've spent the last uh, more than a decade now working to understand people and wildlife interactions, particularly doing uh, research on human wildlife con conflict and then uh, implementing conservation programs in the field that help mitigate uh, conflict as well and we've worked across India we worked in you know what 20 different sites in different states trying to document um, what is human wildlife conflict um, uh, is there compensation uh, how do mi people mitigate conflict and overall what do you uh, find and what is very clear from our research is that India is a high wildlife high conflict country we have about a hundred thousand incidents per year of conflict uh, fortunately, most of this, 95% of this, is either crop damage or livestock predation, and less than 5% is human injury or human death. So a lot of it is still manageable, but where the tolerance uh, flips and turns into retaliation is when repeated conflict takes place. Say somebody's losing their crops 20, 30 times to an elephant outside Nagarhole, or losing you know, goats and sheep repeated number of times to leopards or tigers in other parts of India and that's when it really the mindset changes to poisoning them uh, chasing them snaring them um, you know uh, electrocuting them but these are also our gods so there was also conflict in in our earlier generations it's something not new but has the intensity changed I mean, why are you kind of seeing so much of I, I honestly Anand, I don't uh, know whether we can specifically say the intensity has changed. Uh, clearly, one thing is there are more people out there studying conflict, documenting it. So we're able to put numbers on the number of incidents the species responsible now, say that we couldn't put, you know, 20, 30 years ago, right? It's, we're getting better at collecting data and analyzing it to uh, pinpoint it. What, ha what we are seeing is that a, there is a lot of conflict reported, particularly in states like Karnataka and Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Orissa, Madhya Pradesh. They're among the most uh, conflict-prone states. But to me, that's also a positive sign because it indicates that there's still wildlife living in these places amidst people. Yes, maybe in tense situations, perhaps they have more wildlife left than states like Haryana or Punjab, where you almost hear of no conflict and no wildlife being present either. You and your team uh, did a massive kind of survey several years back, kind of mapping conflict kind of thing. Uh, tell us about that huge exercise that you carried on several states and what kind of different types of results you got. So this was originally supposed to be a project that started around Khana in Madhya Pradesh. It was supposed to be one park and just trying to get an understanding of spatial uh, distribution of conflict. But over the last 10 years, we've now worked in Ma Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, all of the southern states. And what it showed us is that broadly the patterns of conflict are similar. Mo in most places, it's, it's fortunately uh, crop damage and property damage. Uh, less so livestock predation and even more fortunately that human injury and human death are minuscule compared to a, for a country this size with high population densities living amidst wildlife. What it also showed us was that tolerance was variable. Uh, in sort of central and north India, when we interviewed people, there was just a more open attitude saying these animals have lived here as long as us. 
and you know once in a while yes a pig comes and destroys my crops but i'm not going to retaliate whereas in in southern india and the northeast you find a little more hostility a little more aggression and i don't know it's it's a, probably a combination of culture diet that a fact that you know these more tolerant uh, states have more vegetarianism in them uh, some um, influence of religion as well uh, i think plays a part but i think fundamentally looking ahead what is going to make a difference between somebody tolerating loss and not tolerating loss is our ability to assist people so you, can you provide excretion compensation payments can you uh, set up early warning systems so that you know these kind of incidents don't continue to just escalate beyond control but often when we talk about human wildlife conflict so we get to the charismatic species the tiger or the leopard or the elephant but your study recorded uh, a long list of species about i think 80 80 plus what was the list kind of uh, it was a, i think 25 30 main species okay. if you look at it from that context actually snakes cause a lot more deaths and injuries but in, uh, when we kind of looked at this across india we still found that there were seven states not compensating or uh, having excretion payments for crop loss there was still one state in india which didn't compensate for human death which i think is completely unacceptable right so there is a variability in terms of how the incident is uh, treated how the species is treated so if you're in karnataka versus madhya pradesh versus assam versus himachal uh, what happens to you uh, is dictated by the state and not by the center right and we are trying to conserve these species across their ranges so selective policies don't help we've kind of worked with the with the center for law and policy and this year we just uh, did a review of the compensation process in the state of karnataka and suggested mechanisms to improve excretion uh, payment processing but also rather than reinvent the whole thing looked at existing government schemes that could be tapped into so that people uh, receive a uh, response and help much quicker than they're getting right now well, the big issue is time delays just inordinate delays from the time somebody calls for help to the time they actually get help or reimbursement i'll come later to the compensation part i'm just saying that in terms of population dynamics mm-hmm. how are species getting affected so we are, we i know we look at the elephant we look at the tiger or the leopard but there are all other also smaller species we think they are common but they are also constantly in conflict they are also getting killed or kind of displaced so in terms of uh, you know the, we are in the middle of the sixth extinction <laughs> all of you have written papers we are very concerned about global kind of population loss so if we look at the other side of on the species side how much they are affected i think i mean india is sort of a mixed bag uh I think we're certainly doing better today than we were in the 50s and 60s and 70s there's no doubt about it people had just you know uh, predicted that tigers would go extinct tigers have not gone extinct they have recovered in some parts of india and they've done miserably in other parts of india so uh, but what is very clear is there are certainly certain species that are more sensitive to people and those that are not so uh, whether it's wild dogs or tigers they definitely need parks they need protection and they need their prey to be secure uh in contrast i think leopards are certainly more adaptable they live amidst people's uh, uh vidya's work has shown that they live in sugarcane fields and adapt to people right so i think uh it's it's really a story of what species are resilient what species are uh, adaptable and those are the ones which perhaps need less help and those are the uh, ones that need help include elephants where you know many elephant biologists say that most elephant populations are found outside parks than inside and if you start talking about grassland species and wetland species they are in even more trouble because enough parks were not set up in those kind of habitats or uh, parks were set up in very forested areas so it's a uh, i think i mean what's clear is globally if you look at wildlife is in trouble there's no doubt about it but i think there are some conservation successes that we should celebrate otherwise you just get into this 
complete doom and gloom slide which at some point depresses people and then you give up <laughs> and you don't want people to give up so coming back to the compensation part so you started wild seaf about 5 years back so tell us the story of wild seaf how did it come to your mind uh, you, you told us already that compensation to people was a huge issue across the country and uh, you were one of the first to start a one of a kind of a program where the villagers who are most affected by uh, wildlife or, or crop predation uh, get kind of due compensation in quick time we i we'd spent about 5 6 years uh, trying to understand conflict and um, and what what the drivers were and what uh, what the government was doing and one thing that stood out uh, which is an amazing thing about india is that the government actually has uh, a process in place for uh, for people to file claims review them and disperse payments for losses suffered to wildlife right there's variability in how this is done across different states but the system exists what we found was it was riddled with uh, 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 corruption uh, delays lack of transparency and that was what was increasing frustration with people who were applying for compensation uh, when we were working across india i realized that uh, people uh, everywhere had a cell phone they had had a lot often had the ability to call and report a conflict incident so we established a toll free number that now reaches over 600 villages around uh, nagarhole and bandipur national parks in karnataka they call in every time they have a conflict incident and our team goes there assist them in building the claim forms whether it be photographs and documents needed and help them file the claim but we don't disperse the money all of the money comes from the karnataka government over the last 5 years we've been able to file 16000 claims and they've received several crores back in compensation from the government i think it is a system where the that demonstrates that the NG, an ngo can play a bridge role and not turn into a bank start dispensing compensation um and that programs now been successful and well established what we're hoping to do with the pandemic is actually launch our wild save version 2 what is clear is we've kind of focused on people uh, keeping people safe from large animals and now we want to focus on the zoonotic diseases covid is one that everybody is familiar with but there is a, a range of other diseases like rabies rinderpest nipa virus also common and uh, these are diseases that transmit from people to wildlife or wildlife to people and so we're launching a new program uh, next month actually uh, that will go to all protected areas in karnataka in the first year uh, to create awareness and um, uh, response mechanisms for these remote communities in partnership with government agencies like the health department uh, forest department um and ag department veterinary departments to really communicate to people why does conflict happen how do you stay safe if you come across a tiger or an elephant and a leopard secondly what are zoonotic diseases what is covid what is rabies what is nipa virus how do you how are you likely to contract these diseases and how do you stay safe when you live in these remote areas more exposed than uh, say you and i were so i'm very excited because we're sort of at the evolution of this uh adding on to conflict but building on to uh, zoonotic diseases and i think it's a wonderful opportunity where you again help people the most vulnerable people living in and around parks in india so wild seaf seaf is your kannadika word for seva yeah seva 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 means in service of it's like seva in hindi uh, compensation is very important but how much can you compensate the attacks or the because what i was reading is the the behavior patterns of the herbivores or the elephants are also changing they are they are more now likely for human produced crops than the forest and this is only going to increase so how do you see this going forward in the near future i think compensation is one tool things that other people are doing one is certainly uh, early warning systems uh, um other organizations like ncf have deployed early warning systems particularly focused on elephants uh, i think this we need a multi sort of tool 
box approach to this you need early warning to try and keep people safe before something happens then you need compensation and mitigation again to address it once it happens i think so i i clearly don't think compensation is the only way to address it it's one uh, but i think it's an important one where it where there's a lot of conflict it occurs frequently and people's livelihoods are immediately lost say you and you're a farmer and you end up farming 6 to 9 months a year maybe some parts of india you can only farm one season and you have a animal that comes in or a herd of animals that comes and destroys your crop there is no way you can feed your family there is no way uh, you can bi- build your livelihood for the rest of the year so i think uh, what is needed is really a uh, ma- multitude of approaches to address this do you see uh, uh, that we need to also change our agricultural pattern because i think certainly because i mean some of the analysis we've done shows that some crops are uh, are more vulnerable so uh, create more conflict so for example in this part of india people plant horse gram in the months of october november december and we find that that is the most frequently raided crop right so can you dissuade people and convince them to grow less conflict prone crop i mean herding patterns are simple we've built livestock sheds that were Uh, for families that were repeatedly losing cows and goats and sheep and immediately it takes away predation by the big cats right and so there are simple easier measures uh, but it's also some level of behavior change of not free grazing your livestock uh, which now also exposes you to disease transmission as well so i think it's really building a bunch of ways to help help people at this point so there was also this debate between kind of free grazing as you mentioned and also stall feeding which never took off kind of thing so do you think stall feeding is a kind of a solution in the future so uh, we've been doing some work uh, i've been working with some economists and social scientists to look at this and interestingly there's sort of a natural transition taking place where we uh, our work suggests that uh, people are beginning to transition from say having a herd of 10 20 cows Uh, which are all native breeds which are but they're willing to risk free grazing in the forest and losing versus uh, having a couple of hybrid cows that yield more milk but are stall fed and we are uh, we're slowly seeing this transition where people are kind of beginning to lower the number of native cows they own and then have hybrid cows that produce more milk but that also comes with two trade offs one with the native cows a lot of the species are drought cattle they're not really milk cattle so uh, then how will they plow their fields and you know use uh, other uh, have other purposes the other issue of course is the hybrid cattle have higher veterinary bills so you uh, uh, you don't want to lose your hybrid cattle to you stall feed them but you also have higher veterinary expenses but the overall economics suggests that having a few hybrid cows is far more sustainable and having large herds of native cows so in this second phase which you are so excited tell me how are you going about the program kind of thing for a viewer who's not been into nagarhole or bandipur somebody sitting in delhi and watching this uh, just give us a sense of how uh, this is i mean this work. is a program we actually hope if our dream would be to do it in every park in india right and it's not just in because there's a lot of communities that who live very close to wildlife in that first 5 to 10 kilometers from the boundary of a park who are just as susceptible and vulnerable so we're starting uh, in parks that we've worked in for a very long time but the uh, the new version is also running these public safety training workshops uh, which inform people about conflict uh, uh, and staying safe uh, about different zoonotic diseases and staying safe and fundamentally uh, why wildlife matters why we're all interconnected and how uh, they play a key part in sort of protecting wildlife into the future and yet keeping themselves and their families safe so uh, i mean i mean a year from now i'll have sort of a clearer answer for you but the plan is to actually reach out to uh, you know 3 400 villages uh, located in key wildlife areas and work with communities and and literally frontline health forest department workers this is the same area in karnataka that you have been working for the past 10 years actually this program will go to uh, 22 different parks in karnataka so wild save is operational in two because we're deeply embedded there and uh, you know 
once you introduce a program or this, you really can't pull out. Whereas this new program is more an awareness program, so we can scale it much more rapidly. Uh, and the idea is to build a network of partners who will keep an eye out on both conflict and uh, disease transmission. But how difficult was it to kind of execute the program? Because these are very remote areas, uh, dif uh, different sets of communities, people, they, uh, some of them so the execution starts next month Anand. i think uh, huh. uh, i think the strengths that we have at this point is we have worked in all of these parks at some point we do have a lot of local partners and connects and the the purpose is to really build and champion those partnerships with us more coming in as the knowledge implementation side of it and have other people really carry forth once the program has been implemented to ensure that conflict is addressed properly and uh, disease outbreaks are something we're more alert to and not surprised by as we've been by COVID. The forest department also was very cooperative in this. We've worked with a lot of uh, lower level forest department staff uh, in a very cordial manner for many years now with the Wild Survey program. Um, uh, unfortunately, last year when I won the Rolex prize, there was a little bit of backlash uh, from some of the top officials. Uh, I, I think uh, that was driven by external factors, not really uh, whether we were really doing the work or not. But tell us about the other program, the Wild Chalet, which is the school program that you have started, also has become very successful. So tell us a bit on that. So having done the research uh, and then uh, implemented Wild Seve, what we've uh, what I've discovered is what we discovered is that a lot of these kids in villages across Karnataka were seeing these big animals and either were totally uninterested or living in fear of them. And so two years ago, we designed a conservation education program that goes to village school kids uh, with three sort of main goals, to increase interest in wildlife and wild places, to build empathy, and to give them some basic safety coping mechanisms where if they or their family are in a conflict situation, what do you do and what do you not do? That program has been hugely successful. In the first year, we went to about 38 schools in three parks, reached about 2,500 children. In our second year, we went to eight parks, 20, more than 20,000 children, and expanded from Karnataka into Maharashtra. Uh, this year, we've made our plans. We have the program ready to go into Madhya Pradesh as well. We, uh, we have a Hindi version of the program. Uh, unfortunately, COVID has stopped us in our tracks. But as soon as schools open, we very much will be taking the program to the third state. What does a typ typical class look like? What happens in a typical class? So we show up. It's not a, we don't show up once. We show up four times in a month. So we pick a school and go to it, say, you know, Tuesday, 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 Tuesday of every, every week. Uh, it's not this boring uh, stand in front of the classroom and give lectures. We have art activities. We have games. Uh, we have storytelling and we have some uh, very uh, uh, appealing visual presentations. So the combination of the program results are, uh, in us being in contact with the children about 15 hours over the course of a month. We give them things to do and uh, homework and fun things to do. And uh, being scientists, we also evaluate how we're doing. So we do a pre-test with many of the children uh, to see what they knew before we started the program and then a post-test at the end. And what we're finding is a, we're currently analyzing the data, a huge in, in, increase in knowledge, hu, huge increase in awareness. And we're also finding that Indian children are highly empathetic. They're inherently highly empathetic. So the empathy score is moving. But given that we're starting at a higher point, uh, you know, the increase is not as big as the increase in knowledge. But certainly uh, it's moving the kids in the right direction. What about the teachers? Are you training them as well? Um, so we worked uh, very well with the teachers and headmasters and they participate very enthusiastically. A consistent request from them has been that we, uh, we get the kids all excited and then we leave. What can the teachers do once we implement the program? So right now we're designing some super fun material uh, that we kind of gift to the school and the teachers can continue a whole bunch of activities once we have introduced Wild Charlie to And it goes to how many schools you said? 
so so far it's gone to 407 schools and almost uh, uh 20350 children oh that's wonderful to hear and that's why you are so hopeful for the future yes i think inherently our our country our our kids have interest in wildlife we have inherent tolerance and empathy we just have to nurture it and foster it a little bit so let me now kind of take you away from your core area of work you have a number of students working on a variety of species subjects kind of thing if you can tell us whether you i know there are students who are working on frogs there's some somebody on tiger so give us a sense about the work that the center for wildlife studies is doing center for wildlife studies was founded by my father dr ulas karanth in 1984 uh, we are an ngo that very much believes in science based conservation so it's not acting based on emotion really collecting information analyzing it and trying to understand what the problem is before trying to fix it uh, so we do a lot of scientific research he pioneered research on tigers and elephants but now we have uh, students who work on otters uh, students working on tourism tourism uh, students working on leopards students working on conflict so it's grown from being pure ecology to a range of applied science issues as well so it's really driven by the people in the organization in terms of what their individual interests are uh, and then my personal sort of uh, motivation now is to take the science and translate it to either policy or an on ground conservation program so it just doesn't become knowledge for the sake of knowledge that you're using the knowledge to um, create impact and have uh, actual tangible uh, changes and improvements to all these in all these different issues uh, where we are but really uh, especially in the urban spaces uh, the people who like like you said policy the people who make policy or kind of decide on policy their their world view is kind of in a box they think wildlife is in national parks and sanctuaries and uh, not outside kind of things a very boxed vision how do you change that perspective from a science point of view i think uh, one good thing that this pandemic has done has turned every a lot of people into bird watchers from their balconies <laughs> as people have been stuck at home you're seeing amazing images and videos coming of people observing wildlife on the streets or in their backyards or uh, city parks and i think it's really finding ways to hook people and engage public and and stop this disconnect of do care for wildlife you really need to go to a wildlife park you can take your kids to the zoo you can go for a walk in the park you will see an amazing number of uh, sort of wildlife species right in your backyards right no i mean of course you're not going really going to find a tiger or an elephant but you'll find amazing frogs amazing butterflies amazing birds and i think is to inculcate that appreciation for nature that goes beyond the big charismatic animals and i think seeing truly seeing is what gets people to to care so before i let you go what is your next apart from the wildlife uh, human wildlife conflict any new program on the cws banner looking at species in india so the biggest new program is the zoonotic diseases one because i think that is the need of the hour in terms of what i am actually shocked about ananda is that even today people are not able to link this pandemic and covid-19 to the fact that we tinkered with nature this happened to happen in china where people went and you know are are trading in wild meat and consuming wild meat but it could very well happen in india you know uh or africa or south america and i think uh, if that visceral connection to nature is not obvious the fact that there are places that you need to set aside for wildlife and that you don't mess with there are places where people and animals can overlap and there are places that need to be defined as human spaces and and how do you sort of keep people and wildlife safe in the overlap areas so that these kind of disease outbreaks don't take place and conflict doesn't take place and retaliation doesn't take place is really what we we need to kind of broaden uh, and reach more people about thank you kriti wonderful having you and best of luck for the wild safe part 2 thank you very much take care take care bye bye, bye.